This is, this is Doug Ladd. He's the legendary uh, wood carver from Three Roads. He has holding one of, just one of his records is skydiving and wood carving at the same time. And I believe he carved how many pieces in? Two pieces on the way down, seven minutes and four seconds. All right. Yeah. He's taught uh, for 30 or some odd years, and uh, he's going to teach us now how to carve wood in the proper way uh, to be safe. And he's going to tell us all about this now. Yeah. You're Good right. to have you with us. Uh, what I'd like you to do before we even start with the carving lesson is let you know why and how we do it. Everything that we're going to be doing today is relevant to cottonwood bark. In the bark of the cottonwood tree is a, an exceptional piece of wood because of the grains. Uh, we need a kind of wood that will hold under duress or strain. And some of the things we make uh, are horses and animals. And you have the thin, thinness of the leg, for instance. Now, the wood you carve, if you were used pine or some of these others, especially cedar, the grain is so loose that you pick it up like this, the legs would break off. Well, with the cottonwood, it's a tight grain wood, and the cottonwood is inside of the bark. The bark itself grows like the rest of the tree. It grows in annual rings. And as you look at the end, you'll see that each of these layers is a year of growth in that bark. Now we're going to take advantage of that. And before I show you the carving, I want to tell you what you do if you've got a piece of wood and you want to make something into it. We want to do revert back to our early years. And for myself, back during the Depression in the 30s, we had very little and what we would do is make up our own games and play with things that were available. Whether it was building a hut down in the swamp or making a shack in the backyard as boys, that's the kind of things we did. Well, when you wanted to be creative, you laid on your back in a meadow and you looked at the clouds. And your imagination is the best asset you have. And if you lay on your back and looked at the clouds, oh, there's Mickey Mouse over there. Over here is a horse. And you see all these visual things that radio helped us develop. Because before television, there was just radio. And they had these programs on. And you listened very intently to it. And it was as if you could see what was going on. Because in your mind, it was a picture made from the monologue and from the people that were acting that just you knew what was going on and that made you build an imagination and uh, memory for your brain. Now we do the same thing with a piece of wood. In here each of us will see something different and with the carving what we do we take a raw piece of bark like this and we turn it from place to place and you'll see a face in here. You'll see an alligator eating up an old man over here. So you can make up all the crazy things you want because it's already in there. Nature has built within the structure of this particular piece of wood something very amazing. And if you look close enough, there are probably ten different faces in here. There could be a, a nose here, an eye here, one on each side of his nose, his mouth down underneath. So I'm looking at it upside down and backwards, but I still can visualize that that kind of thing is in there. Another face here, this is the beginning of a nose, an eye socket on each side of that nose, a long beard coming down underneath with a mouth back in there. So. Your imagination is the best tool you have. Each of us has something very, very important in us. So what we want to do is use our imagination, go from our experiences, and build on this. And that's what we will be doing in the next small se session. <laughs>
That's why I like having you with two cameras. Right. Yep. Right. Go ahead. All right. What we're going to do this morning is take raw material and turn it into something special. Now, I have a box full of things that I've made since last Monday. And to show you that it can be done uh, just from a blank of wood, which is something that I pre-cut and then I shape it into a workable product. So this is the kind of idea that we're going to be working with. Take a outline, which gives you an a imaginary a method of what we're going to look at, and then turn it with detailing into this type of unit. This is a uh, howling coyote or, or wolf. We have here a piece of wood turned into a tortoise. And this is one of the things we're going to make this morning very, very quickly. And this is what we're looking at, the finished, unpainted, unvarnished piece. But this is one of the things. Last night I sat in front of the TV and watched and made this little teddy bear. And again, that teddy bear was in there before I even started. These are the kinds of things I really like. We've got a blank piece of wood, and it's a cross. Now, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily like to see the crucifix on the cross, and but some denominations do. This is a uh, crucifix with the uh, Christus on the cross, and that is, uh, for me, uh, a 40-minute piece of work. And I want to tell you a little interesting story. Uh, when Nick Walenda was walking across the Grand Canyon in the spring, uh, I was so impressed by his devout religious background that he talked to Jesus all the way going across. So while he was doing it, I carved a portrait of Christ in a piece of wood, and I mailed it to him the following morning. And uh, he was quite uh, appreciative to get it. But here's another one, and what it is, it shows, I call it the old rugged cross, and this is one that's out in the hills, and it's got ivy in, uh, flowers and everything growing up the side of it, but it gives you an opportunity to express yourself with three-dimensional uh, overlay. And it's all one piece with the materials taken away in order to make it work. All right, with that much said, and there's thousands of pieces that we can do, and we can go extreme detail, and if you look closely at this little truck, there's a man sitting inside in the driver's seat, and you can uh, make out his hands, his face, everything. And that's an internal cut all done with a $3 knife. So the important thing I want to emphasize right now is you don't need a whole box full of expensive tools to be uh, a creative wood carver. And at any place you are, you're in your studio. You can be sitting along the side of a, uh, a road with your cup out trying to collect money from people or <laughs> You could be in your penthouse uh, in, in a towering uh, special house and do the same thing. The tools that we're going to use, and I want to start with the very basics. Number one, we teach toward safety. This is all that we need. Is a uh, you call it an exacto knife. This this is a pro pro edge. It's a professional made knife in. New Jersey, it's made with U.S. steel and U.S. machinery, and it's very, very precision and lasts a long time. It has interchangeable blades. We've got one uh, knife that is like $3, and it loads from the front. This is a $7 knife, and it loads from the back. And you, you turn the back of the knife to take the blade out and replace it with a new one. Now before we even put that knife in our hand, 
We want to think about you're a beginning carver, you've never done anything before in your life. Cut. <laughs> Is it done, Stephen? <laughs> Sorry, but I didn't want to think of that. Uh, we can always cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Beginners, what I want you to do is understand that we're working with a, a scalpel type of knife. It's very, very sharp. It holds the edge. And I'm going to show you when you're carving, I want that knife right on the end of your finger. Because that's where you have total control. And control is the secret to what we do in wood carving. My magic answer is... Painter's tape, the blue tape that you buy at Walmart paint department or any hardware store, and we're going to take a piece of blue tape, and we're going to make a thimble, if you're right-handed, the middle finger of your right hand, we're going to put a piece of tape over the top and push it down, as you can see here, that's going to cover it so that we can put that knife right on it. A second piece of tape I want in the opposite direction, going over the top and over. And the final piece, the third one, will wrap around on the side. That just holds it in place. In doing so, the middle finger of your holding hand, if you're left-handed, you will have it middle finger of the left hand. If you're right-handed, the middle finger of the right hand. We're going to take the knife and we're going to hold it as if it were a paintbrush. Very lightly between the thumb and forefinger with the sharp part of the blade right on the blue tape. My motto is when you're carving, beginners, this is critical. Blade is on the blue. The blade is on the blue. So we're putting the sharp part. Notice I can push right down on that and it does not bother my finger one little bit. Now I'm going to just take any piece of wood that I've got here and I'll pick up this little uh, donkey that I was working with. And I'm going to use these fingers to hold the blade where I want it. The thumb of the other hand does all the work. The thumb here pushes the blade, and I begin to take wood away in small volume to the level that I want to do. The key here is have control of the blade and know exactly where the point is. And if you have any concerns about getting cut, if you have the blade on the blue, your chances are very minimal to get cut. Notice, these fingers on the right hand never come anywhere near the sharp blade. It's a physical impossibility to bend your the bones in your finger to work that way. It won't, it won't happen. The only thing that you have to be concerned about is the finger on the opposite hand. If you're not paying attention, you can nick it, and don't be concerned if you do, I do it too often. Yeah. Because what happens, you get a little confident in what you're doing, and you'll hit the piece. And that's the process. These are your eyes. They tell your brain exactly where the knife is. This is blade on the blue so that you don't get cut. And all the work is done with the opposite thumb. I'm pushing, controlling, telling exactly where it is. The eye fingers maintain a message to your brain that says, I know where that blade is. The blade is actually your middle finger. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to take a piece of wood that is pre-cut and show you the technique of how to go from uh, a blank wood and 
we're going to turn it into a cowboy boot. This is the kind of thing uh, I did when I set my first two world records uh, skydiving. I made a pair of cowboy boots on the way down. So the first thing we do, we look at a cowboy boot as a basic shape. And uh, the toe on a cowboy boot is pointed. And unfortunately, I don't have one that has been trimmed, uh, but I've already pre-done it. And I made the side on uh, both edges into uh, a pointed toe. I narrowed up the heel, which is a high heel. Each of these things has a reason. The pointed toe on the cowboy boot is because the cowboy runs over to get on his horse, he throws his foot into the stirrup, the pointed toe makes sure he doesn't miss. Then he throws the foot over, puts the other one in, and the high heel catches on the metal bar within the stirrup, keeps him from falling out when he's at a full gallop. So each has a reason. Now what we're going to do, look at it from a point of view of why and how they make the shoe. The bottom of the shoe is the part that wears, and we have to separate it from the upper part, which is a series of pieces of leather sewn together, and we're going to separate the sole from the body of the boot, and we make a little neck. Now the neck starts at the toe, and we have to remember the grain of the wood. So I've made a little neck here. Now I bring the point of my blade about a sixteenth of an inch from the bottom, and I'm going to run it all the way around, across the bottom, and over to the center of the back of the boot. Now this I call a stop line. And you're going to hear a lot of words about stop lines as I give you more and more lessons on wood carving, because the stop line is how you control what the grain of the wood does as we're carving. We want to take a chunk out of there, but we don't want to take away part of the sole. So I'm making another, a second cut that's, again, about a sixteenth of an inch away, and I'm pulling a chip right out of that block, and I'm making an indentation in the side of the carving that represents the dividing line between the sole and the body of the boot, in, in a matter of seconds, we have cut that all in. Now the next thing we do is start looking at how the leather is actually made and why it's there. The toe has to have room for his foot to slide up in, so it's rounded. And all you have to do is look at your own shoes, unless they're sandals, of course, and do exactly the way you would see it, because I rounded out the top. Now, we have this folded area, which we call the instep, and that, it gets cut away slightly. And notice, now we've got this indentation for the toe. This is the instep. Now we've got a heel that has to come up to an ankle. I tip it over, lay it on the blue, and we come here and just take another small amount. Notice I go with the grain. The grain changes from one end to the other, so I go from up to down. Now we've hollowed that out. That's where the ankle is. So we've got an ankle bone that goes all the way around, and in a matter of seconds, we've got that entire bottom half of the boot roughed in. We've got the crease for the separator. We've got the hollow for the toe. We've got a, enough room for the ankle and the heel to fit in. Now we come to the calf of the leg, tip it over. We want to go with the grain and just notice if it cracks, the grains change. Now I'm going downhill here. We want it rounded because the back of the boot is rounded. It comes over here, up to the front. We duplicate the process. And all of a sudden, we've got the entire 
the leather part of the boot roughed out. Now these little extensions on the top are called boot straps because this helps the cowboy when he's putting the boot on. And what we're going to do is make them elevated above the body of the boot. I make a stop line, a cut on the back of that strap, a stop line and a cut, a stop line at the base of that, cut it out, and there it is. We've got the bootstrap all complete. Now it's narrow and it's a piece of leather that comes up and over and it's sewn on the outside through to the inside. So I want to separate that. I put the point of my knife in, take a chip out. Don't go all the way across because I get to the other side. I'm finishing this little bit up. And at this point, we are almost finished making a cowboy boot with bootstraps. There it is. While we are away, I uh, finished up the other side of our boot, and you can see the importance of the depth. And another thing I want to add to what we've been talking about and doing is, if we want it to show up, undercutting is the key to success. And uh, you'll notice I use two knives because the blades are different on each of the ones I use. But if we take where we did the stop line to begin with and just very easily recut it, undercutting just the slightest amount, that means you're going in behind the front. Then when the light hits that carving, there's a shadow cast onto the body and that undercutting is what makes it stand out. And that's how we get three-dimensional pieces and how in, in each of these things that you see, if we want it to show up more, we go underneath, underneath, and take a chip out from behind. That sliver will give us a shadow and it cleans it up and makes it more noticeable. So that's a very important part to remember. Undercutting anything that you want to show more it is how we solve the problem of having one part of the wood blend through into the other. Okay, now we're through with the uh, cowboy boot for a minute. Let's take and look at a blank here. And uh, this is easily identifiable as a turtle outline. And all I did, I had some scrap wood over in my shop, and I just made out a whole bunch of circles, all different, at random, any old way that I found a piece of scrap, I just cut away to save it. And the, the, the wood comes like this, and I can make a turtle here, here, and here by just freehand cutting it out. Well, that's what I did. Then I left wood for a head, two front legs, two front back legs, and a tail. I just took it away. To make it a little faster and easier for me, I set the block like this here on the saw, and I just sliced it across. That cuts all of this wood off, saves me uh, half a minute on each side, and I can do the same across the back because the turtle shell itself is rounded. Now, what I did, I took a whole series of these yesterday, and I made, this is a rough blank, and I made a little teaching aid that's going to help us in understanding what we're going to do when I get going. I won't have to talk so much. So I'm going to take the blank, and one piece at a time, I went to the bottom and I separated, as you can see, where the shell is and where the legs come out. So I've got the shell, a stop line, 
a chip out here and a chip out of there for the net, and that tells me exactly where everything has to go. Now I went to this side and I cut out one leg. So that as you're looking at the teaching aid, you're saying, okay, if I do one step at a time, forget everything else, just that one leg, you, your concentration is better and you're able to control what you do because that's all you're thinking about. Your mind is not filled up with a lot of unnecessary information uh, of where does the head go, how do I do this, how do I do that. Do one thing at a time and make this leg. When you get it done, come over, do the same thing again. The repetition will give you a little bit more confidence and it will allow you to continue with this. All right, the next step I did, I took the head and I did exactly the same thing as an aid for you to see it. You have to pretend that these are already done, but I made that look like a turtle's head. And the best way to Remember what a turtle's head looks like. It looks something like this because they take the head out of the uh, shell and they look around. So this is a turtle's head and with my fist it even looks like one. You see? And you got a long skinny neck with a skull up here. There is such a thing as a turtle's skull. So that's what I did in cutting this thing out. I got a long skinny neck with a skull covered and a little make-believe mouth that's open catching flies. That's the second step. Then I took a third piece and I did exactly the same thing all over again for the back end. I did leg one, leg two, and then the tail, and they all come out from underneath the shell. So there, that's easily done one step at a time, and all the stuff up here, don't even think about it. What we're doing is making it work. Now, as you can see, once we get that, we've got to make that uh, head look as though it's coming from inside. And so what I did, and I'm going to show you with a, one that we make all the way through in a minute. We want it to look as if it's hollow, and that's coming out from inside there. So that's the next step, is to make it so that you're looking inside where the neck goes under the shell, legs go under the shell, all the way around. So that's the next step, and I'm doing this in a sequence so that you can see what it is. When that's all done, we're going to round off the shape of the turtle shell itself and we're going to put that pattern in there that uh, shows it, make it look like a turtle shell. And that, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, this takes the most time because you've got stop line and a chip, stop line and a chip, and any pattern would make it look like a turtle that you want to do for it. Okay, with that underway, let's take a piece that's already ready to go and make us a turtle. All right, there, this is a blank. It's all done. And as I said, first thing we want to do is get the bottom, and we have to separate all of the parts, back legs, tail, and head, we're going to separate them from the shell itself. So I'm just at a stop line and cutting the wood away that we don't want. Be sure you're always leaving wood for the things that you know have to be cut. And I'm ensuring by starting on the bottom that the shell has the appearance of being and we got a hard piece of wood which makes it just a little slower there we go the airplane does not come with the lesson there we go now this is the, the net goes up inside the shell there we are we come around and already, 
What we have is the bottom of the turtle. Here's the shell. All four extremities there. The tail set. Now we're ready for the for the head. And because I want to do one thing at a time, I'm going to start with the head. And remember what we said. The head comes out of the shell and his neck is so that he can turn it. So that means he's looking around over the top of his head. Notice how I hold the blade on the blue. I'm pushing with the thumb of my left hand because I'm right-handed. You, if you're different, you do the opposite. And now there, in a matter of seconds, we've got the head roughed in from the bottom. Now we're going to take it from the top down. We said there's a skull up there. We know the basic shape of a skull on a turtle. And all mammals and animals and reptiles have a basic skull structure. So what I'm doing here, I'm getting rid of excess wood that we don't need for this head sticking out of the shell. And again, notice I'm being very careful to not take too much wood, but take enough. Now, there in a matter of seconds, much less than a minute, it seems like it's a long time, but I spend more time showing it to you and talking about it than I do carving. Now you see what we've got. We've got that head coming out of there. How do we make it look like a head? Put a mouth in. A little chip, stop line from the top, take a chip out. Stop line from the top, Take a chip out. Stop line from the top and see what we've got now. He's got his mouth off, open, catching flies. Now the first thing I want to do is get rid of some of this excess wood that makes up the shell. So going with the grain, and again, as you get into this and practice a little bit, you'll always know which way the grain goes. Because if it digs in and it's not doing what you want it to do, turn it around and go the other way. Because the grain of the wood is critical in taking the wood away. Otherwise, it'll splinter and take off more wood than you'd like. Here we go. We've got that front leg all done in a matter of seconds. I'm pushing the shell down. Come over here. Do the other front leg. And notice I go with the grain and I curl my knife with the use of my wrist that allows me to cut very evenly. And by the way, you might be interested in knowing this blade has been in this knife for a week now to show you how good the blades are from uh, the U.S. That has done all of the things that I showed you earlier as well as much more. Now I've got two front legs all done now and you see how it's beginning to look a lot like a turtle. All right, And we can take a little more here, a little more there, but by the time we get done we'll have it perfect. I'm turning it around now and we're going to round off the back half, pushing basically all the work being done with my left hand. By the way, we've had the great privilege of working with handicapped people in here who have had strokes, and we I invented a machine that helps people that only have one hand learn how to carve. And we set it up and teach you with it. And uh, I've had three exceptional one-handed carvers uh, in my career here at Country Roads. Uh, I'm quite proud of that fact. And so you can, if critical, 
work with one hand. As a matter of fact, I had surgery done on my shoulders and was unable to use my left hand for about four weeks, and I carved regularly using just my right hand. There we go. We have roughed out the entire turtle, leaving, leaving it look as though most people will identify what it's going to be. Now next we said we had to start with the detailing. I'm going to thin up his neck because he's got to have a neck coming off of that skull. And it's coming from inside, from inside the shell. I'm going to take underneath, I'm going to put a stop line right along the edge of the shell. I'm only going to do one side for now. All right, I got another one going at a 30 degree angle approximately, and one in the opposite end, and I'm going to take a chip out. Remember we said you get it to notice by undercutting slightly. We took a chip coming right out between the leg here and the neck. Now we've separated that. We're going to come up with a stop line on the outside. And this is that opening that his neck comes out of. You notice I turn the block as well as my knife as I'm coming around. Now I'm taking the chip out from the back side of that stop line. There we go, we'll get it with the other camera. We're really doing very, very well on a very pressured type of time element. Now I want to do the same thing over here with a stop line and a stop line in the back and a chip out on the front. Stop line and a chip. A stop line and a chip. And we have that head coming right out of his shell. To continue, we're going to follow that concept all the way around, and we're coming here with a stop line. This is the shell itself. Take away that meat that's underneath to make that particular leg come out from the inside the shell. Notice, two stop lines is all it takes. Over the top of that foot, it comes out of the shell. We're here. On the side, a stop line on the bottom. Hollow it out. Front to back. We now have separated the head and two legs, and it will be coming out from the inside. What I work with basically right now is uh, cottonwood bark. It's readily available to me, but uh, you were asking uh, where does it grow the best? You have to have severe weather in order for the bark on a tree to get extra large. And we work uh, to the best extent with thick bark and not thin bark. We could go right over here on the Gila River and find all kinds of cottonwood trees grown along the bank. But the bark is only probably an inch, inch and a half thick because of the temper uh, temperatures and weather that we have here. And the best stuff comes from Alaska, uh, British Columbia, wherever you have severe winters, and the bark protects the inner part of the tree. So what I look for, because I want to do big things, I look for thick bark, uh, the width and the depth. And out of these pieces, uh, we'll show you a little later how you study it and how you can bring things out that are already in there. Got it. And what's neat about this is, it's like people. 
inside every single one of us, the Lord put in something very, very special. Well, in every piece of bark, it's the same way. You look at it and you see something in there. Now your job is to take it out. You mean like a clouds when you exactly. look at the clouds? When we were little, uh, and I was born in the 20s, and all through the 30s, our toys, this is during the heart of the Depression, our toys were what we made of it. And I used to go out on the meadow and lay on my back and look at the clouds and I'd see Mickey Mouse over here and a duck over there and all these things in the clouds. Well, it's exactly the same way with a piece of wood. The grain, the texture of the outside, all of these things come into your brain. Now your purpose is to bring it out. Good. And as I said, like people, inside all of us is something so special in my job is to bring it out. Can you buy it, the wood? Do you uh, buy the wood from that, stores? or No. Uh, we have a number of people that found it that it has value uh, for carvers, and they'll bring it down from the North Country and sell it. They get uh, upwards of $10 for a piece that's like 18 inches w uh, long and thick. Because a new fad we have now, and I'll show you a little later, uh, is to put faces into bark. And that's what a lot of people do. Uh, I teach my people to be more creative. And what we do, we make castles in the sky, mythical types of things, and it allows your imagination to see stuff in there that others don't, and then show it to them. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing we'll be doing uh, when we get into this. Great.